Well, I'm Seth Crawford, co-founder of Oregon CBD, and we are here today to talk a little bit about our new triploid varieties and the breeding process, start to finish, uh, that we use here at Oregon CBD to push the boundaries of cannabis science forward every day. We're gonna be looking at some shipping containers and tents that we use for inbreeding projects. And we're gonna take a look at our ploidy manipulation lab where we convert plants from diploid to tetrapoid. And we're gonna end up finally in here looking at some of those brand new triploid varieties and looking at just how resinous they really are. So this is a really good example of the beginning of the process. Uh, it takes us about three years to go from a concept uh, or a new trait that we're trying to inter introduce into the varieties that we're making to the point where we actually have F1 seed for farmers to be able to use in a field. But the first step in that process is working with a known plant with known characteristics and then taking another plant that is new, uh, that has one of those other new traits of interest. and cross-pollinating them and this is a great example of that these plants have been pollinated and they're starting to make seed the seed on these plants will finish up in about three weeks from now uh, we'll dry the material we'll harvest it and we'll clean the seed like we would any other crop but this seed then gets started and goes into breeding tents for selection and phenotype evaluation once the plants are done being grown, then we take them to our chemistry lab and we test them with HPLC uh, to identify any of the, identify the plants with the highest levels of cannabinoids and more importantly for our work, novel cannabinoids that we're trying to intergress. So this is, this is one of those other shipping containers. We have 32 breeding tents. What we do is we'll take two asexually propagated clones of the same plant and spray one of them with STS to make it uh, create male pollen, even though it's genetically female. That pollen is then used to essentially self-pollinate the other non-reversed female clone, and we make seed. The seed's in the same way, collected after that, and started, and we go through the whole selection process. So right now we're in Greenhouse 2. I'm gonna go through the process for converting plants. The first step, is after we've gotten the plants is we'll trim it down to just a single mare stem. For this plant you can see it's right at the top just right here this one single mare stem and after that what we'll do is we'll uh, take a piece of cotton and we'll just wrap it right around that one single mare stem and then come in with colchicine and add just a little bit of colchicine to fully hydrate that cotton swab. So after everything's been treated we we need to keep the plants moist and warm so that they have a good environment to grow in. To do that we use a second one of these black trays and we prop it up with cinder blocks and then we use this plastic to wrap all the way around to ensure that it holds that humidity inside. Once, once everything's uh, been treated, we do the treatments for four days in a row. At the end of the fourth day, we pull the cotton off and then rinse the mare stems with water so that we rinse off any of that excess colchicine. And then after, after they've been treated, uh, in about two weeks, we'll start to see growth from those points. And with that growth, we'll take them up to the tissue culture building to start running flow on them and to check our results. So at this point, I've, gotten, I've got a plant that's been treated with colchicine. Uh, just one single mare stem was treated. And then what we have in front of us is a plant that's grown up from that single mare stem. And what I'll do is I'll come in with a pair of scissors and I'll take just one leaf sample. The samples can range in size. Uh, we don't need a whole leaf. I can use as little as just a leaf tip, very small. Um, we have two buffers that the sample goes into. The first one's an extraction buffer. That just helps make sure that when you're chopping the plant material, the nuclei in the plant material don't break apart. And the second one is a fluorescent stain buffer. Uh, which dyes the nuclei of the cells within the plant material, which makes it possible for our flow cytometer to actually read the genetic material in the nuclei. 
So this is the extraction buffer. It goes into a Petri dish. It gets chopped. The nuclei get stained. We then run the plant material through a filter so we don't clog up our machine. It goes into the sample cell and then it should start running. So after the sample has been prepared and we put it into the flow machine, what the flow cytometer actually does is it, it takes the liquid that we just prepared and it runs it through a very small cuvette in a single file line where it lines up all the nuclei in just one row and then it shoots a UV light through the nuclei as it goes through this one cuvette. So based off of how the UV light reflects off of the nuclei that we just prepared, uh, that's how it gets the readout and we get the um, results on a graph. So it's kind of like a relative peak of the genetic material within the nuclei. So we're in our R&D greenhouse. Uh, these are all Awaska trials. So these plants are triploids. Uh, these are the plants that are in farmers' fields in 2021. Uh, we're growing these out just to demonstrate uniformity uh, across all the varieties. They've just been top dressed uh, and fed water uh, for their life cycle. And this particular plant, this is a sour lifter. This is the beginning of week eight of flower. And, uh, you can see that there's a lot of uniformity, a lot of resin, and honestly, a lot more flowers than you would see on a diploid variety. One of the biggest challenges that farmers face every year is pollination risks. And the best part about these plants, in addition to more olfactory compounds, higher resin coverage and denser flowers, is that they can't be pollinated. Uh, so this is sort of a new paradigm where farmers don't have to worry about hermaphrodites. Farmers don't have to worry about their neighbors, uh, both from getting pollinated and pollinating them on accident with their own plants if something goes wrong. It's really the best safety feature that we can offer uh, cannabis farmers around the country. And they do smell good. One of the most interesting features of polyploid cannabis so triploids, tetraploids, et cetera, higher levels of ploidy other than diploid, is that the resin coverage on sugar leaves, on those leaves that are surrounding the flowers, is a lot more dense than what you would see in a diploid. And it's consistent across all of these plants. While we found that total cannabinoid content is not statistically uh, different between diploids, triploids, and tetraploids uh, with type three CBD varieties, what we can say is that on a per plant basis, if you're farming for biomass uh, or if you're trying to have higher value trim products at the end of the process, these new triploids are going to give you a much higher uh, overall cannabinoid yield for the waste material that you would normally not get as much money for. Hopefully the higher oil content will uh, help farmers get better returns. Ah, that smells so good. Yeah, this is the one. No, sorry. This is the one. No, no, this one's good too. They're all good. One of the things that we saw in field trials uh, last summer with triploids versus their diploid counterparts is that the diploids tend to initiate flowering a little bit earlier. Uh, the triploids lag by about a week, but they make up for it by the end of harvest and finish at about the same time because they go through the flowering process slightly faster. Uh, so once they ramp up, they, they really take off. Just dense. Cannabis plant expressing itself fully. Higher ploidy levels give you more copies of genes that are responsible for olfactory compounds cannabinoids, and growth. We're currently doing experiments with different higher ploidy levels. Uh, just this morning had a, an 8x plant 
Uh, so this is eight whole genome copies within one plant as opposed to two that we would see normally with diploids. Um, and we're very excited to flower that out and see what the results are. So if we've learned anything over the last five years of trying to develop high cannabinoid, high aroma, high value industrial hemp varieties, it's that there are certain standouts. Uh, one of the best standouts that we've developed is Lifter. In its diploid form, Lifter was the highest yielding variety in field trials at the University of Vermont in 2020 with over 4,000 pounds of biomass per acre on average. Uh, absolutely blew away the competition. Had the second highest overall cannabinoid content, second only to Suver Haze uh, at 14.1% CBD. It's really the pinnacle of non-psychoactive cannabis until this year with these new improved varieties. We're taking tried and true industrial hemp cultivars that we've worked on for a long time and really making them better, uh, making them more vigorous, having more aroma compounds, and providing more high value cannabinoids for farmers in a way that really demonstrates how cannabis is going to be moving forward throughout the rest of our lifetime. This is one of those moments in time where cannabis breeding is changing and it's changing permanently. Uh, diploid cannabis will only be used for grain production. Polyploid cannabis is what's going to be used for cannabinoid production from here on out. The improvements that we're seeing in yield, in seedlessness characteristics, and in flavor uh, just demonstrate the potential that polyploid cannabis has for farmers and for breeders for generations to come.